Okay, so hello everyone. Today is the first uh, colloquium of the ICC of this, of this academic year, and we have the pleasure of having uh, Ari Gubar. And uh, let me tell you a little bit uh, about him. So um, he actually was, was not uh, from the beginning uh, uh, someone looking for supernova, but at the beginning he was uh, cheesing for the Higgs during, uh, during his PhD. And um, he had the first, uh, one of the first, uh, of his first uh, um, prediction, which was, uh, I'm not gonna stay in X physics because it's gonna be found in 20 years. And indeed, in 21 years was found. So that was the first thing. He is uh, uh, currently the director of an institute that is looking for the electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational wave, which is a very important thing because we need, we need those things to, to understand whether the gravitational wave we see are related to spe particular objects like black holes or neutron star. It was in 2015-2016, uh, the director of the Oscar Klein Center, that is a, a center in Stockholm of uh, um, cosmoparticle physics. And uh, well, he was, uh, the most important thing is that he was part of the of the uh, Supernova Cosmology Project. And the Supernova Cosmology Project is the project that won the Nobel Prize for uh, discovering basically that the universe is, uh, is expanding uh, in an accelerated way. Um, he's part of many collaborations. He was part of Delphi at the beginning uh, of his career as a PhD student. And um, now he's still part of the, of course, of the, of the Supernova Cosmology Project and other, uh, other important experiments like the SDSS, the, um, is, uh, the, 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 the Supernova, uh, pardon, the SNAP satellite and many other, the Amanda Neutrino Telescope and other experiments. So he's basically part of all these things. And um, he has also, in 2000, he had another uh, prediction which was uh, that uh, Messi will become the best player uh, of the world, and indeed, uh, he was quite right. So today, <laughs> today we'll talk about uh, illuminating the dark universe uh, with supernova. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Very Thank you. Is this one on? Can you hear me? Uh, maybe, is it on? Yes, okay. So thank you very much for the very kind introduction, Cristiano, and, and for the invitation. It's really great to be here. The only bad thing is Barca is not playing this weekend. That's the only sad part. But as uh, I will be talking about supernovae and how we have learned to study the universe with supernovae. And of course, I will start this, with this journey um, sort of reminding you all of the excitement we felt uh, seven years ago when we learned that the uh, two uh, supernova projects were, were and, and the leads of the two supernova projects were given the Nobel Prize for the discovery in physics, for the discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe through observations of distant supernovae. And I thought I was digging in my photo archive and I found, found the pictures of the two collaborations. And here on the left, you can see your own Pilar sitting here. This is the, uh, you know, very different dress codes. This is the high Z team, the bad guys, as we call them. And this is the good people. You can see, you know, much more natural. Anyway, so this is everyone excited in, in 2011. Just to bring everyone to the same page, I'll go back a century, just to sort of give you a sense of, of how things have moved along over 100 years. So let's go back to what we usually call the Hubble law, okay? So Edwin Hubble, in 1929, put up this, you know, kind of weird looking graph where you have distance on the horizontal axis and velo recession velocity of galaxies on the vertical axis. And he boldly drew a line here, and um, the, uh, this, sort of the, the linear relation between the recession velocity and the distance to these galaxies was sort of the, uh, was very soon interpret, interpreted as being the, the, one of the most key signatures of an expanding universe. There's only one flaw with this, is, which is, actually it had already been pointed out two years before by Lemaitre, who sadly published this in a very obscure small journal in Belgium in French. So no, actually it never caught on. But uh, it's actually now a big movement that people have actually gone back, read the papers, and there is an, actually an, an ongoing vote at the Inter uh, International Astronomical Union to relabel the law, to you know, call it the hubble lemaitre law. So throughout this talk, I will be talking about it as the hubble lemaitre uh, law, so, so you know why I do that. I voted yes for that, by the way. Uh, 
So let me then ask to continue the journey. Let me tell you how, when I, as, as Cristiano was saying, I was a particle physicist. Um, I had just finished my thesis, put, I had put a limit on the Higgs. You know, I, it felt hopeless. It felt like the Higgs would be a uh, much higher mass. So I decided to switch on to cosmology. And at the time, um, in the 80s and 90s, the questions we thought we were going to address is how the expansion of the universe is slowed down due to the effect of gravity. So we were going to essentially weigh the mass of the universe in the same way as if I throw my keys here and will fall down, it will have to do something with the, the gravity, the attractive force of, of the Earth. Um, so we were going to weigh the universe. And of course, that way of thinking was very deeply rooted in general relativity where essentially, you know, where, you know, the way to say this is that uh, matter tells space how to curve and uh, space tells matter how to move. This is sort of the way we typically look at a general relativity. And then again, in the, uh, by the, the act of, of the attractive nature of gravity, the universe will slow down. Now, we should have known better though, because already one year later, 1917, Einstein had actually modified his equation to add one more term, which he called the cosmological constant. Now, he did so for the wrong reasons. At the time, he thought the universe was, well, everyone at the time thought the universe was static, okay? So we already went through this. The universe, if gravity is only attractive, so unless you have some, something, you know, pushing back, the uni it was very hard to imagine a static universe. So in order to rescue a static universe, he introduces a repelling uh, force, not necessarily seen as a force, but a term which actually has that effect. And uh, you, know, you know, history then, you know, both Friedman and Lemaitre show that to Einstein that actually this would not sort solve the problem because that would not be an, you know, a, a stable solution. But never mind. Once you, he introduced this term, this term was there to stay, except that nobody took it seriously for many, many years, especially since the universe was not static. All right, so, you know, not much happened there. Uh, the next step in, in, in this story I'm telling is uh, type 1a supernovae. Um, and sometime around the 80s, late 80s, people uh, were, uh, you know, empirically realizing that there was one subtype of supernovae, type 1a supernovae, not the most abundant ones, but yes, one among the brightest ones, but appeared to be very, very homogeneous. So explosions were equally bright regardless of where it, they exploded, in which galaxy they exploded. So that led to the thought that those could be used as standard candles, okay? Pretty much as I can figure out, to say, if I put a lamp, right, and I, the further it is from me, the fewer light will reach my hand, let's say. The same way you can imagine that you, you, you treat them as, as lamps in the universe, you know, carefully placed in some galaxies, and, and by seeing how, how strong they shine on your telescope, you can figure out how far that galaxy is from you. So, and just to see the power of type 1a supernova, let me show you an old, by now very old Hubble diagram, but nevertheless, it sort of shows the point that this is the original Hubble diagram I showed you before, the one with Hubble, down here. With supernova, you can go, we could go much, much further, and for sure, they were much, much, they were very sharp sound of candles, so the linear hubble Lemaitre uh, law could actually uh, be shown very, very um, clearly with type 1a supernovae. So back in those days when you know, hair was fashionable, I, I now think hair is terrible, so uh, I joined the group of, um, as I said, I sort of I made my bet, you know, particle physics would have to wait for 20 years for the Higgs, let me do something else. I joined a group of Carl, Penny Packer, and Sol Perlmutter at, at the LBL in Berkeley to, you know, originally the idea was to measure the decelerate, the, how the universe is slowing down due to gravity. So we were going to expand the Hubble diagram I showed you to larger distances, so you, we were expecting to see the deviation from the linear Hubble Lemaitre law. Um, so around those, time, those times, things, people, there was sort of some noise in the background. People were starting to revive the cosmological constant. It had to do with things that people measuring the ages of stars in our own galaxy and finding that, hmm, they seem too old for the age of the universe we were to derive if there was no cosmological constant. There were other sort of circumstantial evidence like that that people started wondering, well, well maybe this you know, cosmological constant isn't so useless after all. So um, 
the question is there, could we do something with supernova about it? And I will not bug you with details, but essentially what we're doing when we are measuring this is, we are measuring distances with supernovae, and we are actually, essentially, what we're doing is figure out how space has been expanding from uh, us for, at the present time to the redshift, the, you know, at when the supernova exploded in the, in the past, okay? Now, in this integral, there are terms which have to do, as we're saying, you know, the, mass, the, dennis, the density in matter, uh, the curvature of the universe, and this dark energy, uh, as I will call it from now on, this, you know, cosmological constant or some, you know, other version of it that might not be constant. The point, the, on, the only point here is that a cosmological constant has always been the same over time, but, you know, we might give ourselves the freedom to think that maybe it's something repel, you know, is it repelling, has it repelling, uh, is, it counters gravity, but it might not have the same density over time. So, everything goes here in the denominator of this integral, so there's an obvious degeneracy, right? Uh, so, throughout the, towards the end of my talk, I will even be generalizing a little bit more and say this dark energy could have, you know, as I was saying, different potential evolutions with time, and this is something that will be labeled in my slides later on, the dark energy equation of state. But don't worry about it for now. So back in those days, uh, in the mid-90s, Saul and I were starting to think whether was there a way we could actually measure both things, both the thing which is slowing down the universe and the thing which is speeding up the universe. And here's sort of a cartoon of how that could possibly work. So imagine now that you are engineering a, 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 an experiment, or rather a set of observations, where you are to find supernovae at different redshifts uh, as noted in, the, in each panel here. So in, if you measure enough of them that you have, a, say, a 2% uh, measurement on average at that redshift, so you have enough supernovae that on average you measure those distances with 2%, what does that tell you about cosmology? In particular, what does it tell you about the mass density of the universe and this <coughs> density in the form of Einstein's cosmological constant? Well, here's the degeneracy I was talking about. Of course, for any given redshift, you know, you can't tell. It's, 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 it's completely degenerate. The key, however, is that as you march on to higher and higher redshifts, you see that the angle and the width of this constraint is changing. So the trivial observation we made is that if you put them all together and you have an experiment that actually samples from all of these redshifts, well, then you have a shot at actually getting a measurement of both the, 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 you know, both the mass density in the horizontal axis and the vacuum energy density or the cosmological constant on the, on the uh, on the vertical axis, and, and we said that that would actually um, be, t it takes about 50 supernovae to do so, you know, with some carefully, you know, engineered uh, survey, so we would be finding supernovae at all this redshift. So, um, so, so one way to put it is that, you know, we have a brake pedal and we have a, an accelerator, but the brake, the, I guess the key point here is that whereas the, accel the acceleration is constant, the mass density, of course, is getting bigger and bigger and bigger as we go back in, the uni uh, in, in time because the universe has been expanding. Therefore, it was, it was more dense earlier on. And therefore, that's what actually why that term becomes more and more important when you go to earlier time. That's why the whole thing works. All right, so for, for fun, I should say that I learned many years later that Brian, uh, who, I've, who I've known actually since many years, since my time as particle physicist, he was the one that refereed the article. And it was actually positive. Uh, so in, actually, in that, in that uh, paper, we also made our, you know, kind of by now, by today's standards, ridiculous, um, we may actually made a Hubble diagram, and we put our point here, which, you know, funnily enough, is actually perfectly consistent with what we know about now about dark energy, but that's, that's only for fun. So going back to the story, so this is then Brian, uh, uh, at the time when he and his uh, sort of Harvard-centered, uh, uh, and then later moving to Australia, but at the time, Harvard Center group sort of realized that this is a good idea. Uh, if this guy can do it, with this thing can do it, we can do it also. So there was a competition, which was, I would say, very, very good for all of us to really get our act together. And um, the, uh, that resulted in the excitement in, uh, reported in 98 that both teams um, sort of raced to get the same result. And, what the result was that uh, as we measured the supernovae at the time here were 40, in our team was 42 supernovae. And what this graph is telling you is that, you know, here is where everyone would have bet their 
husbands, wives, whatever, that uh, the, the data would lie. I would certainly have done it. Bef before, bef you know, I wouldn't tell that to my wife today, but I would have bet many things that that's where the answer was. So we were all shocked that actually that the, the universe chose something different for us. And in order to explain this, we say, well, you know, this is the critically flat universe. You can just say, well, it, it is less modern universe than you thought. Then you can draw the red line. But at some point, you just emptied all the universe of all matter. And it's still, this supernova are too faint. Too faint means that too, too distant. Too distant means that the universe is not at all slowing down as much as, as fast as we thought. It's actually speeding up. So the explanation then came to be that we need this cosmological constant, or AKA dark energy, to explain the data. And that's sort of, you know, now we are celebrating 20 years of this, this universe, which sort of pretty much looks like this. This is sort of the, this is a, a, a modern measurement, the modern pi diagram, but the numbers haven't changed by a lot. So it's about two thirds in this dark energy, uh, uh, about, you know, 25 or 6% uh, of dark matter, which we also know don't know what it is. Uh, you know, everyone has a favorite candidate perhaps, but we don't know what it is. And the stuff we are made of, is sort of a sad minority of 5%. So the stuff we learn at school, you know, the, all this stuff uh, is actually only 5%. So maybe, you know, our, you know every, our kids are wasting their time learning all this stuff when they, they are not le learning much about the 95% that we know about. All right, so um, how are we doing here? Okay, so um, I want to take a step back and tell you, okay, so why was this found in the 90s? What was exactly that went on? And I think it's, Again, for the young people in the audience here, it's good to figure out, you know, where, where should I put my career here? And I think what was really, really critical to remember is, or keep an eye on, is what is technology? Where is technology going? What made it possible in the 90s to, to scan the sky, to look for supernovae and make these measurements was CCD technology. All of a sudden, People went from doing, you know, photographic plates, going to the telescope, doing photographic plates, go, you know, take, you know, go back home and analyze the data many weeks later, to image, image the sky, uh, you know, have a digital image, transport it fast to your fast computer. It was not that fast, but you know, fast, fast enough computers at home and your lab, and do image comparisons so you can actually detect supernovae. Well, they were still brightening. The point was that it was no good if you found a supernova a year after it exploded. That's completely useless. The fact is that we needed to be fast. Find this supernova fast enough to measure their peak brightness because that is what we measure, use to measure distances. So this is actually how a camera really looks like. And this is sort of, you know, a typically at the measurements I've been showing you now sort of are, are at the scale of a of the moon or slightly bigger. That's how big cameras had to be in order to do this in a, in a meaningful way. So let me then jump to now, fast forward, okay? So now I showed you this pitiful looking graph first from Hubble, then we have this 42 supernova we were extremely proud about. But that's nothing compared to the most recent, and actually I'm giving credit, this is the competition by the way, uh, this is not a paper I'm involved in, but I think it sort of shows, is the most recent one, it shows that the nice combined effort of the whole community. This is, all these names here are different constellations of, of researchers. And I'll be sort of touching up on what we learned and where we're heading, okay? So this is again, this is exactly the same cosmology. So you don't, you know, there, there's so much data, you don't see the line, but there's a line here showing the best cosmology. And it is essentially the same cosmology we found back in 98. There's not, nothing has changed. It's sort of the one showed in this pie chart. Uh, all right, so let me then give you a sense for how good the data is. I just taken all the data in that previous plot. I removed the, the labels, and I'm just binning it now for, you may see your, uh, for your benefit to see it easy. And you see the, 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 the significance of dark energy is overwhelming. There is, uh, you know, there is no reason anyone in their right, set of, in their right mind can actually argue that dark energy is not uh, you know, has been not detected. It is, is totally out of the question, both by supernova and by a number of other techniques. So the detection is super, super robust. But it is still an embarrassment because we don't really understand what it is we have measured, to be quite frank. Um, because although it was just a, con for, for, you know, for, for Einstein it was a constant of nature. There was no, no preferred value for it. Any value could be, but of course, 
in, in modern thinking, if you, if you to put it into the language of quantum field theory, there is a prediction for what the energy, once you take all the stuff you know, from space, what energy is in that space, what we call the vacuum energy, it has to do with you know, virtual particle and uh, creation and, and annihilation of particles, and we sort of know the mass spectrum of particles. And if you play that game and try to figure out what is the energy of empty space, well, the number comes out to be absurdly much larger than we measure. In fact, it's so absurdly large that had the universe had these values, we wouldn't be here to talk about it because that universe would have just expanded f so fast that no structure would have ever been built, okay? So we didn't have to do the experiment to figure out that that's not the answer. But the point is that we measure something which is very precisely, as I showed in the previous slide, and it's very, very different from at least a very naive prediction. So I guess, you know, uh, we don't know what the answer, I, you know, I, let me start from saying what it, I don't, we don't know what the answer is. Maybe what we're measuring, then people have been thinking, well, maybe it's not the vacuum energy at all. Maybe, you know, that maybe the vacuum energy, there is some symmetry we don't understand yet, which sets it to zero, and, and there, is, there is then some other thing we're measuring, or maybe this, again, it has to do with some, some time uh, dependence, that yeah, maybe the energy at the onset of the universe was as large, but very quickly it decayed to something very small. That's what we measured today. Uh, maybe again, there's no vacuum energy, but we are seeing some scalar field, uh, just similar to the, uh, those of you familiar with the inflationary period in the early universe. There was a period of acceleration in the early universe, and that, of course, then uh, left that, you know, it, it, went, it made, was a transition was made, and it's no long, it was not accelerated for many, many, uh, for a long time. And now we're back to some, some sort of uh, periodic inf inflationary period. Maybe what we're seeing here is just the effect that, you know, the fact that we don't understand, that we don't have a proper theory of, or, or, or gravity, you know. Uh, there is, uh, you know, we have a classic theory of gravity, we don't have a quantum theory of gravity, maybe that's the problem. And then, of course, that connects to string theory, you know, maybe we're seeing, uh, maybe it is this huge value, but it is spread over many dimensions, and therefore in our three plus one, that's what we're seeing. Here I'm just speculating, I'm just saying that theories, I'm not one of them have thrown a lot of exciting ideas. Of course, we don't have a clue which, which if any of those, have any uh, bearing reality. So the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, observers like myself, I thought, well, let's say, you know, we, we better go on measuring. Maybe one of these things is true, or maybe that we will, you know, discover another ex better explanation. But we keep doing this, and we try to figure out whether we can see whether that equi the um, uh, dark energy has a time dependence or not. So I'm showing you from the same paper, the latest on that, and I not, will not bug you with details. The point is, it's not only supernovae, there are large-scale structures, you know, cosmic micro background measurements, and they all surprisingly, or not surprisingly, but you know, it, it's just shocking how they all agree, no matter which you know, combination of experiment, observations you do, this one or that one, they all land on sort of the, the value which is consistent with the cosmological constant. So from as, from right now, we don't have, no one have any evidence that there is a deviation from a constant. But on the other hand, we have not excluded many models anyway. Those, the other models, of course, are constructed to create a very small difference. So then uh, the next question is, of course, um, where do we go? Where do we go from here? Okay. So if you, I don't know if in the back of the room you see this, but the one thing you can uh, you might be able to see is that up the highest redshifts, uh, where in principle we have the biggest discrimination of dark energy, that's where we have the fewest supernovae. Okay, those are come from these surveys. What all of these surveys have in common is that they are observations made with made with a Hubble Space Telescope. Let me try to give you a sense for that why that is the case, why that has to be the case, and why there are so few. Okay, so let me see if I. All right, so what I'm showing you here is a spectrum. So the, um, the flux of a typical type 1a supernova at rest frame as a function of wavelength, okay? Where I've marked the optical range, the UV range, and the near infrared. Now, everything I've shown you so far are measurements done in the optical range, okay? That's where we have, our telescopes are made for that. UV is very, very tough, you know, essentially it's, it's uh, Everything absorbs in the UV, right? So the atmosphere doesn't, doesn't let you through. You have to, again, do a measurement from above, uh, above the atmosphere. And the situation is, is also 
difficult than near infrared because there you have absorption in the atmosphere, but also emission. You know, when you're looking at the faint source, you're competing by diffuse radiation from the atmosphere, which is many, many times brighter than the thing you want to observe, and therefore is not so easy. Right, so we're, you know, as at low reaches, we're fine. We're, we're looking at, at the optical thing. As we go to high and high reaches, everything, all the action in the supernova is moved to the infrared, okay? Uh, so you, if you see these numbers going up here, once you go above redshift one, all the stuff, all the supernova light, has, because of cosmological redshift, okay, has moved to the infrared. So it means that optical telescopes are not very useful to find a supernova. So we need to go to uh, something from space. And at the moment, what we have in space is the Hubble Space Telescope, which has a hundred times smaller field of view than the ones on the ground. So 100 times smaller means you have 100 times harder time to find things because you are sampling essentially 100 times fewer galaxies. You see, so that, that's why there are so few of them. So this is where, the, for the future, people are excited about satellite missions which have a wide field of view, okay? Unlike Hubble, you know, missions dedicated to search for transient phenomena or rare things in, in general, which then will uh, have a much bigger field of view than what's currently the case for uh, Hubble. And then things like WFIRST and Euclid and, and maybe JWST we could do something about that. Okay, so that's on the higher end. I'll now move the focus to the low redshift world, what actually, you know, throughout sort of the rest of my talk, I will be focusing on this because that's what we'll be, I've been working for a number of years now. So right here in this graph, you can see why there could be a problem. Unlike he, these cases where you have dedicated efforts like the SESS, you know, the Supernova Legacy Survey, etc., dedicated essentially like particle physics light, like teams working very hard to get the calibration right, to do everything accurate enough for precision. This is a bunch of, uh, you know, loosely, you know, there are a lot of different surveys, you know, with different strategies, uh, different selection criteria you know, different criteria for what they keep and what it, what it, it should not follow. And this is, of course, not really, you, it's not obvious that you can compare the supernova found here with the ones in this, in this ranges here. Uh, at least you can worry that that's where the problem could be. So, um, so again, so uh, just to make it clear, just to re-emphasize, so in the near infrared, that's where we probably will be, uh, maybe, uh, be targeting to see changes in the dark energy uh, density over time. And in the low ridge, it is where we will be anchoring, you know, this, this graph has to be anchored, right? And we need to do it very precisely because this one otherwise translates, propagates into an error here. Hubble constant is a very hot topic. I will not say much about it, but obviously the better sample you get here, the better you will nail the Hubble constant from supernovae. Um, so there's a number of, uh, of, you know, we need to understand, by the way, the thing I not, you know, have time to explain is that this is a very empirical field. We do not understand type 1a supernovae yet to the extent that we would like to, right? If you want to use some, you know, you're using a probe to measure accurate cosmology, you're much better off if you understand the physics of the thing which is exploding than if you don't. Of course, when we study things in nearby universe, our means to study those explosions in great detail are much uh, more adequate than very decent things. So, so by compiling a new data set, carefully studied, we might be better at you know, excluding systematic effects that might be hitting us over here. All right, so just to show you one example, in this you know, Skull Naked Al paper, I just extracted a graph from their, uh, from their paper, and the one issue is essentially all of these points here, but bin, okay? And the one thing you might worry about is that there is this peculiar, obviously, you know, systematic jump up and down on the, on the, these are the residuals from this line, okay? Uh, and it's obviously not very satisfying that we have those problems. For the supernovae, we should measure the best, okay? All right, so what is my personal approach to this was, was to join the uh, Intermediate Palomar Transient Factory. In fact, this was a continuation of something what was called the Palomar Transient Factory that was run between 2009 and 2012. Uh, my team joined in 2013, and this is transitioning to something called ZTF, which just started. Um, and this is based on um, a few telescopes at the Palomar Mountain, which is sort of a two hours drive from 
uh, Los Angeles, or two hours drive from San Diego or something like that. Um, and it it's, has a search telescope, you know, 48 inch, 1.2 meters, a follow-up uh, instrument at the one and a half meter, 60 inch, and, and occasionally we also use a five meter telescope for follow-up. And actually it's pretty funny because this is the same telescope that, you know, you've probably seen this iconic picture of a Hubble. Hubble never used this telescope, but he, you know, he is sort of given the iconic picture of this telescope. Of course, everything, including Hubble has been ro ro you know, exchanged. Everything in the telescope has been changing, obviously, is, is completely robotic. And uh, it has a huge camera. So this is the camera that we used to have until a year ago, the IPTF. Uh, and you see, this is sort of when I started do working on supernatural cosmology, that was, that was considered to be the large field of view. With IPTF, of course, the thing went much, much bigger. So 7.2 square degrees. And the key here is not only being big on sky, you have to be fast. So we had a fantastic track record of, uh, you know, scanning the sky, you look at some galaxy, you compare it with a galaxy you had looked at previously, uh, and you do an image subtraction, you find you, something that looks real, something that looks not, well, something that you have to tell was real or not, some other funky thing in the image, we, you know, you, you know, with so much data, humans don't have a chance to be like me here deciding I be trusting one, this one, and I don't trust this one. We have, you know, machine learning to figure out what is a real astrophysical, astrophysical signal as opposed to some artifact in the image processing. So, you know, with, you see, follow the time, you have three minutes and a half minute. Within half a minute, the machine has told us, uh, all right, uh, this one, I, you know, please take, take a look at this one. It, it looks real. It goes to the database. At the time when it's data's being collected in, in, in California, we are nine hours ahead in Stockholm and 10 hours ahead in Israel, also part of the experiment. And there we have, you know, committed grad students, postdocs, senior people, staring at the things that the computer told us, better look at this one because I think it's real. So we then look at these things and within say, essentially five minutes from observations, we are ready there to trigger some follow-up observations if we think this is really, really exciting, okay? So the point is that fast coverage of the sky, but if you want to some, find something time critical, you better have your software uh, that is tuned to that. And I, I, I would say that we've been very good at that. Um, so um, I, um, see, am I doing your time? Okay. Uh, so what I was going to, let me just tell you then, this is sort of distribution in the sky of the things we found with the IPTF and PDFs. You see supernova all over the place. The differences you can see between here and there is the weather, actually. It's not that we didn't try to find as many supernova here, but this is sort of the Californian winter, lots of rain. So the only difference between here is, is when this, this part of the sky is up. So, you know, these are things you have, of course, to take into account uh, when you're trying to, you know, measure things that have to do with anisotropies, et cetera, that there is, there is a weather effect which is very obvious. Now, just to give you a feeling for the kind of things we've been doing, I'll focus on two supernovae out of these, you know, many thousands. Uh, the closest one and the farthest ones, okay? Again, just to give you the, the range of things we can look at. So if I start on the closest one, um, and this was a pretty exciting moment in my career. <laughs> uh, this one exploded, and it was the closest type 1A supernovae in, in, you know, in modern time, at least the closest uh, in, in, that was, you know, at the time when the Hubble telescope was up there, and, and it happened to be one which was just behind, as you see from this picture, behind the thick layers of dust. And one of the problems uh, that with type 1A supernovae is that we do not understand exactly what's going on with the dimming of light with dust. And of course, correction, co properly correcting for the extinction is very, very crucial when we do cosmology. I will not go into details on that, but you might want to ask me in, in the, in the, uh, for questions. But just to give you a sense for the data we collected on this thing, I'm combining here data we had from two different telescopes. But you see, this is a beautiful, you know, we have data on this, on this looking at this galaxy, and then bang, 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 and then whoop, it goes on. So you can really follow the supernova from the onset. And, and this, you know, goes on, you know, so it's very, very highly, high frequency and lots of data. So that was a pretty exciting data set to work with. And, you know, if, some of the headlines is that we, uh, we I think most of us, uh, and Pilar, I want to comment on this at some point, most of us thought that type 1A supernovae were 
happening when one white dwarf was accreting mass from a, a bigger star. But I think so far, all the data we have on very well measured supernova like this one uh, and, and, a few, and, and others suggest that the most likely outcome actually is from the of type 1a supernova is rather when two white dwarfs merge rather than a white dwarf and, and a bigger star. So we have evidence from you know, not seeing some particular signature early on here that we were looking for, but also from not seeing anything, other signatures we were expecting at, at late times. The other thing I, you know, I've, I, I was very excited about is, again, we could do this measurement. We could tr trigger the Hubble Space Telescope. We could trigger you know, observations in the medium infrared, in the near infrared, everything. And we got this, and it's probably hard to see from the back of the room, but we have this amazing coverage from the UV to the medium infrared of the dimming as a fun of the uh, light as a function of wavelength. And the only thing you should look at here is the line that, these are the data points, okay? And this is what na you would naively have expected if you have, would treat it as a star in the Milky Way. If you think, how is the light of any star, in, or an average star, I would say, of the Milky Way dimmed as a function of wavelength? Well, that is what is going on. Clearly, that's not what's happening with type one, with this particular type one in supernova and many with it. A very different extinction law, and it's very intriguing. And I worked many years on this, but again, it, it's it's too technical to get into that. But we can talk about it offline if, if you are interested. And now to the farthest, because it's, again, it's one of the, again one of the highlights of, of in my research for <laughs> in recent time. You know, it, it's fun when you get all excited, and I got really excited about this one. I, I have to tell you that for many years, I was obsessed about searching the sky for lens supernovae. You know, I, I, I had programs at ESO looking at clusters. We found nothing. Um, and here it is. One Sunday, I am at home, kind of bored, because we're supposed to go to, with a trip. My wife, the trip had to be canceled. I'm looking at the data stream, and I see something that just threw off my, me off my chair. It is a supernova uh, at Redshift point four, which was incredibly bright. Incredibly bright. It was 30 standard deviations off from what it had to be in the Hubble diagram for that redshift. So this is what this thing is showing you. This is sort of showing you in different colors for different filters where the supernova uh, was supposed to be. You know, these are standard canons, right? And here's the data which is how, how, where it was. So it was a boost of at least, you know, a factor of between 50 and 80. I'll, I'll return to that. And that was, you know, to me, in my mind, was, was an obvious explanation. It, this thing had to be lensed, okay? And uh, so this is the explanation uh, that uh, we figured that, well, you know, what could be going on here is that the galaxy which we see nearest to this is not the galaxy, but it's actually a hot galaxy, but it's a foreign galaxy. So what we see here is actually the superposition of multiple images of, of the supernova that we cannot resolve from our you know, blurry images from the ground. So the decision for me was pretty obvious. We need to hit this with a Hubble Space Telescope and, image, and imagers from the ground that have the power to resolve you know, very, very small image separations, which we cannot do with a, you know, sort of an old telescope at, at Palomar. So we got time, oops, sorry, we got time. And at first, and it was super exciting. We, we, we were working on uh, K-band imaging at uh, the, uh, so 2.2 micron imaging at VLT, and it was an instrument called NECO, and it was working, it was not working, it was all night, we were sort of struggling, me over Skype, and, and this guy operator at, at, the, uh, at the telescope, and we were struggling, and it wasn't obvious. So just to give you an idea, so this is our image from Palomar, okay? It's a blob. We cannot tell that it's multiple images, but because it just the resolution is awful. This is the image we got from uh, VLT, and it was sort of, hinting that it was asymmetric. So we were excited enough to try to get an image from Keck. And Keck had a very nice laser-guided uh, active um, adaptive optics, the thing that you can use to correct for atmosphere and get a sharp image. And you don't see it here very well enough, but let me then give you the next image, which I think clearly. So eventually we got the Hubble telescope to point at it. You know, it was kind of tedious to try to convince everyone at Hubble a Space Telescope to really go for it. Uh, and, but that was not that very hard, but to really go for it quickly. They told me, oh yeah, we can look at it in three, four weeks time. So no, 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 you have to, no, the supernova is fading. Eventually they did that. And you can really see, you know, this is then, you can see here how the images look from the ground. When you resolve it, you see that there are actually four images of the supernova. It's a quadruply lens supernova. And this is sort of the HST images in the optical. 
And this is from Keck in the near infrared. So you see sort of an arclet from the galaxy and the four images. Now, this is very cool because we can use this to measure, uh, and this sort of zoom in here, we can uh, use this to measure time delays in principle. Another way to study the dark universe, study cosmology, is to measure the arrival times of these images. They, you know, since they're going through different paths and sensing different absolute lengths and different, uh, different uh, distance from the core of the lens, uh, the sensing different gravity, uh, they will actually arrive at different times. And in principle, this can be used to measure the Hubble constant and also dark energy. And at this point, if I have, yeah, I think I have some time, I have to give credit to the guy who invented this technique, who sadly died uh, some years before we can actually start discovering this lens supernovae. So Shruv Revstal, a brilliant Norwegian astronomer who actually was the one, uh, and actually he cites Zwicky as being the one that first talked about, about lensing, but he was the one that invented this ingenious idea that by measuring the, the uh, arrival time of light from different supernovae, you can actually measure the absolute scale of cosmology. Uh, a fun story, I met him, uh, uh, you know, many, many years later after this paper, and he told me a fascinating story. This, and this work he did as a thing, as a part of his master thesis. Uh, the person who was grading his master thesis says, oh, all the other stuff you've done is great, this is junk, so please remove it, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not passing your master's, your master's, you're not getting your master's degree if you keep this thing on. So, you know, again, for young students, sometimes, you know, older professors do not get the picture. And I, I know what was the problem with the reviewer, but never mind. It, it's, it's sort of a funny story. Uh, obviously, this was published, and this became a part of his PhD. You know, right? <laughs> so, okay, good, I'm fine, good. So, um, here is where I'm fascinated. Okay, so I did not, in, in spite of the fact that I've been chasing less supernovae, this one blew me away because I just could not, I could not see how we could find such a highly lensed supernova. What you see here is now a sort of a Monte Carlo simulation of given, you know, a survey of the sky, given how uh, bright your things you're sensitive for, what you should find. And um, uh, to make a long story short, this, the, the, the redshift and the brightness of the supernova found is easily five or six, six sigma off from our expectations. So well, that clearly says something about, you know, I think our expectations, or else we were just ridiculously lucky with this one we got. It could be. But, um, but you know, the question is, what could be going on? So first of all, you know, again, uh, we have to be open-minded because part of the story is there has been a lot of strongly lensed galaxies and active galactic nuclei that people have studied. But the key here is that those are found by people looking at Im highly resolved images and seeing, ha, ah, that object looks just like that object. And therefore, they have to be, has to be strongly lensed. So by de almost by definition, they would never find systems which are so close, where the multiple images are so close to each other, like in our case, 0.3 arc seconds, which corresponds to about a kiloparsec in the, in the scale of the lensing galaxy. So this is a rather unique lensing system. It's, I'm not saying it's, it's super unique, but it's, it's a really novel way to look for lens systems. So it might be that we are sort of hitting um, unknown territory, so therefore our, you know, Monte Carlo simulations of what it should look like, it just might not capture the full story. So I, I told you, we could find it because we were not looking for things resolved in space, but it just, we found it in time domain, a time domain uh, survey where we are looking for standard candles, among other things, and we find one which is off by so and so much. So what we've learned by studying the system is that there has to be uh, microlensing uh, going on. So in fact, you can almost see it from these images here. We just go back quickly here. Uh, you can see here by the symmetry of these things that the, the images have, these are different filters, by the way, I should say. So different wavelengths. Uh, if we just take this one, for example, you see that the images are, have very different brightness. And if you just look about the symmetry in space, you can almost get the gut feeling that given the high symmetry in the system, they should be have the same brightness, because they are, but they don't, which is telling us two things. One is that we need to worry about extinction in the, in the lensing galaxy, but the other one is we need to worry about uh, substructures that, substructures that could, that could uh, be focusing some of the images more than others. 
So uh, in the last five minutes, I think I have, I'll be focusing on how do we move on from here? Uh, what is the next thing? So what we are doing since June this year is a scale-up version of uh, the camera we had at Palomar. We now we moved on to a much bigger camera, okay? This is what we used to have, and now we're up here. This is the Swiki transient facility. By the combination of, of camera size and technology being better, we are actually scanning this guy 12 times faster than we used to do. And very importantly, we're doing this in three filters. In, in IPTF, we, in, in order to scan this guy, we were stuck to with, you know, we didn't have time to do more than one filter, which is a, a big, 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 big loss. So this is very exciting. So let me just a uh, couple of slides show you what can we learn from ZTF. And, and just I take two very specific examples. I mean, the, the variety of things we can learn is immense, but I don't have time to talk about it. So one is this thing is dark energy. Uh, again, I had this equation of state. I will not bug you in details. This is sort of a current status, some alternative models to cosmos are constant. The point being that uh, if you are able to anchor the Hubble diagram accurately at low redshifts with a sample like the one we are collecting in 2000 supernovae, you can take an experiment that cost a fortune like this W first satellite and you take it without and with the data set and you see, you know, you win a factor two just by combined, if you do it properly and the data is good enough as we hope, you, we would win, you know, lots in precision of our uh, uh, understanding of, or not our understanding, our measurement of the equation of state of dark energy. Uh, we'll get it for free more or less because we're, we're scanning this guy anyway. Uh, what about lens supernovae? Well, so we just put out a paper uh, last week, no, just a couple of weeks ago, I guess, uh, where we uh, made a prediction that, you know, now we are, we are now, we have optimized the way we look for these things in the new data. And we think we should find seven lens supernovae per year, uh, about a quarter of them being 1A. So many of these will not be the standard candles. They will be a bit tougher to work on. And here are some pretty pictures uh, Danny uh, Goldson, who's the lead author in this paper, made about, you know, assuming we get HST time, this is how the systems we would be uh, looking for. And again, we, the typical magnification of these things will be more like 25 or 30, not the 60 or so we found for IPTF 16GU. So maybe there is something we did not understand, and these estimates are turn out to be conservative. I'm not sure. All right, I think I'm actually perfectly in time. I have 30 seconds to go. Uh, so I'm going to just uh, essentially sum up here that uh, we, uh, I, you know, supernova has been, uh, you know, for the last 20 plus years, been uh, extremely useful to study distances in the universe. Uh, and we found this dark energy that we don't know where it is. You know, my encouragement to theorists is please step it up. You know, you guys, maybe, maybe it is a cosmological constant as we were talking with Cristiano before, before the talk. And we just need, you know, somebody very bright, hopefully in this audience here, that will tell us why is, what is the fault in the argument, what's, why the argument we use is, is false and what is the right way to think about it. Or else we might find some time dependence, then, you know, people like me, observers, will be happy. Uh, we will need, however, uh, that probably, you know, we could, there could be surprises, but most likely there will be the need for uh, the forthcoming large space surveys as Euclid and W first. Which again, they, I, I didn't say that, but uh, Euclid, of course, focuses on the, some of these growth techniques, the binary acoustic oscillation and weak lensing, which again is beyond my scope, but there are very exciting techniques to study dark energy besides supernovae. Um, I, I'm excited about the low redshift supernova surveys uh, by us, but also we have strong competitors, and, and we will, I think, get, we're heading towards a statistical and systematic accuracy both to understand dark energy better, but also to resolve, there's a current tension about the, uh, the measurement of the Hubble, the current rate, expansion rate of the universe, the Hubble constant. I think our data and others might actually at least tell us if there is something wrong with the current measurements, or, or just, if not, great, then it will actually confirm that this tension is there and maybe there's new physics. And again, I'm uh, excited about this new frontier about gravitational lens supernovae, which again, through time delays, we'll also measure the Hubble constant. And who knows, uh, again, we need, history has told us that the more techniques we have, we don't, nobody believes a measurement which is based on one technique. So I think the more techniques out there, the better. Uh, so with those words, I, I close. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Ariel, for a wonderful colloquium. Um, before going to question, let me tell you that at APAS3, students and postdoc can, can meet with Ariel with an informal meeting to ask about uh, career or ask about physics, uh, whatever you want, in the Pere Pasqual. Okay, so you are all invited to come. And now we can go for some questions if you have. Raise the hand. As you wish. Go. I'm, I would like to know um, from the CTF if you have found a proportion of early flashes of type 1A supernova that sometimes indicate us that there is a helium detonation a mechanism for exploding the white dwarf, or there is a companion, or there is something. What is the proportion? And if you can also tell us if in the CTF we also do superluminous supernova or counterparts of uh, gravitational waves, what, do, what is there? Right, so, so let me take the first thing. So as, I, as I mentioned, we started th taking data in June. So we are, one of my postdocs, Mattia Bula, is exactly at collecting the statistics to answer your first question. So, so I would say the analysis is ongoing. So I, you know, I wouldn't, you know, it would be premature to answer it. But we're on top of that, uh, we have beautiful data, let's say. We just have to compare with models and see you know, what can be ruled out. So um, as, as for your second question, yes, I, I should actually maybe, uh, you might get the wrong impression from what this, I'm showing you my personal preferences, but we have seven or eight different uh, science working groups in ZTF. Everything actually from solar system to stellar variability to other kinds of transients like superluminous, luminous, supernovae, core collapse supernovae, a huge group, right? Uh, EMGW counterparts, again, major effort. Uh, so, you know, the idea has been to cover all the exciting angles of time domain astrophysics, and I, I just, you know, made a small landing on one of the topics that was relevant for this particular colloquium. But yeah, but any ideas are welcome, by the way. Yeah, thanks. In this idea about um, dark energy depending on time, is there at least some time scale in which you can base some measurement or? Right. No, I mean, we just essentially it's data driven, right? In the sense that uh, we know that already, uh, let's put it like this. So already we, what I actually showed you, let me just go back quickly to give you an idea. So the data we have already includes a lot of time, right? Because, uh, um, sorry, if I go back here. So the dependent has to be, oh, sorry. The dependent has to be very, very, very weak, right? Here we go. Um, so the data we have here has, our supernovae are typically at redshifts, let's say, one or lower. But the CMB is essentially, is, is sort of something in the sky at the redshift of 1,000. And the BAO is, is again, low redshift. So, you know, the, um, there are, what this is essentially tell, telling you here, the fact that it's so many was that the any de deviation on time has to be extremely, extremely weak. Uh, and, uh, but again, there is not a, from the point of view of theory, I think theories are tr rather trying to explain the, it's the, the, the data rather, I don't know, I, please, and please correct me wrong, I don't know of, of theories which are super predictive uh, on that, on you know, what the physics has to be, exact time scale, but others might chime in here. Uh. Other questions? Well, let me ask you one thing. So, um, so how do you, can we can we actually say that uh, actually the, the supernova are accelerating? So if I only look at the, uh, at the supernova, it's not possible that somehow the, there is a dimming of light, right? So like uh, not due to the expansion, but because of due to some other physics. Right. So I I've been working on that for the last eighteen years. That, that's how it's sort of a hypothesis, and um, uh, not because I, I think is something I believe in, but I think it's, it's a very valid question. And I, I think uh, uh, the, uh, let me put it this way. There's no way we can explain the acceleration by dimming in the line of sight. However, I'm still not super sure that moving on to experiments like W first, et cetera, whether that will not be the, the uh, dominant effect. In fact, uh, I, I, one of the things, I put out a paper a, a few months ago where I was actually uh, 
one of the things you could do if you are, if you are, uh, if you are a bad person, you could let's see if I find let me see if I find it. Uh, let's see if I, I'm sorry. Oh crap! Here, here. One of the things uh, you can do if if you are this thing is act this jump here, and I you know I can explain this in, 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 in offline. But if you are trying to be a devil's advocate and you say, what physics could do this jump? Well, one of the things that could do it, I don't say it is doing it, but one of the things that certainly fits the data nicely is, is, uh, is uh, a intergalactic dust. If you, if you think about galaxies uh, you know, expelling dust, as if we know that that, hap that happens. If you, you know, galaxy formation is both inflow and outflow. So if you throw, uh, and this you need about 10 to the minus omega, no, in the critical density, something like 10 to the minus 5 in, in, in dust. That already would, that would actually explain this. Um, in fact, I did this analysis before I looked. It was completely blind. I didn't see this data. I was going to set an upper limit on this. And I, when I opened the box, I realized, oh my god. Uh, it's not a null result, but it's a positive detection. But, but again, I, I, I will not trust it because at the moment, this is data coming from so many surveys. I'm not sure if I trust it. It's one of the things where I think ZTF will, again, and others, a homogeneous data set. Of course, if a homogeneous data set will give you this, then, then I think I have an explanation. But, but I, I wouldn't put my hands on fire on that. But, but it, we're looking at those alternatives very, I personally look at very, very, cl very, very closely. Yeah. Yes. Here in this plot, you have two points, the beginning. Yes. And then you have three, four, five, six, seven, eight points. Yes. Uh, how robust is this statistic of this binning to say that this, only these two points are the, are the most significant ones? No, yeah. no, no. I'm not saying those are the most significant ones. I'm saying that if you, uh, these ones are, I'm only saying that these ones, if, if you're going to, the question is what do you trust? Do you trust yeah. the, the surveys that have spent enormous effort in getting the calibration right? Or do you trust these ones where the authors essentially say, we're not sure. So uh, my only point is, and, and again, I, this is not my graph, but the point being that if, if, you, if you take the best, so this is the best average, right? And the, the, the average goes through the, these points, and there are deviant points from the average. And the ones which are below rigid point one are the ones which come from these more problematic surveys. I'm not saying that that's, again, or, I, I don't know how the explanation of that. But it is well known that systematics cannot be ruled out on those, whereas systematics on these ones would be much more surprising. Okay. Oh, I have another short question. Yes. In one of your last biographs, when you show the, the plots of the far away supernovae, and there is a statement who says that this, uh, with more observation, we will, we will be uh, able to clarify something about the dark energy. Why don't you include mat dark matter there? Oh, no, absolutely. So, so, so uh, maybe I should say that uh, the dark matter density, yes, we will, again, it, it's already amazingly well constrained by CMB experiments, for example. There, the question with dark matter is, you know, it, could we actually find a culprit? Could we find now? There are laboratory experiments trying to figure out. We know the density very, very well. Uh, and the question is, but what is it made of? Is it like black holes, or like I'm feeling here, or is it wimps, you know, axions, whatever? So the questions are quite different. For dark energy, is like we don't even have a, you know, even a strong candidate other than a constant, in which case we're done. Yeah. Yep. Um, so when you need to resolve the degeneracy between lensing and closeness for a supernova, is your only chance to look at a high resolution picture and hope that there are like pretty pictures for you to, or do you have another method? So can you say that again? So uh, for lensed supernovas, yes. uh, you see that there is like a degeneracy between how lens it is and how close it is, right? Yes. Oh, now I see what, now I see what, yeah, this one, yes. S yes, so, so how do you solve this? How can you solve this without looking at High resolution pictures. Right. Uh, so, so we have, in, so in, the, in this paper, we actually work out the technique to how to do this. So, what we will be doing is we'll be looking for supernovae 
which the closest galaxy is, a, is an, an elliptical galaxy. We know that lenses, most, the most massive galaxies are elliptical galaxies. So, uh, and those, um, so whenever we find, let's say, a very bright supernova, which is close to uh, an elliptical galaxy, we will just look whether it, that brightness seems to originate from the same redshift of the, is it consistent with the redshift of the galaxy here? Or is it too bright even for that galaxy? In which case, we will go back here and try to, you know, we are getting spectroscopy, by the way. So we, we are getting, at some point, we, we identify systems like this one. We go and get a redshift, right? So we will know the redshift. We have the redshift of this guy. We see whether they are in the same place or not. But we are targeting systems where you have a new source very close to a very bright elliptical galaxy. That's, that's our criteria, essentially. Okay, so, although there is a concert outside, is there a, any last question? <laughs> no? Then lo, let's not forget at half past three to meet with Ariel in the Pere Pasqual. And uh, let's thank Ariel for this fantastic uh, colloquium. Thank you. Thank you.